Great, uh, and welcome uh, this afternoon uh, to our conversation with Barry Sternlich, the chairman and CEO of Starward Capital Group. I'm Michael Billerman, uh, the head of the real estate team at Citi. Uh, and we're really happy for all of you joining us here today. Uh, disclosures uh, are available upon request and they'll be uh, shown at some point during uh, the video. Uh, for those that are not familiar, Starward Capital Group is uh, one of the largest private investment firms uh, with over $75 billion in assets under management, a deep focus on global real estate, uh, but extensive investments across different industries uh, as well as product. Um, and so uh, very happy to have us with us today, Barry Sternlich. Barry, uh, welcome. Thanks, Michael. Glad to be here. Uh, it would be great if we were in person, uh, but I'm glad that technology brings us together in a uh, virtual world. Uh, everything's going well with you. And I'm in Florida. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think by the looks of it, I'd much rather be in Florida right now. Uh, it looks like people are having a lot of fun and uh, everything's back open. That is true. Things are, are quite happening down here. More importantly, nobody's dying. So there's what was one death two weeks ago, zero deaths last week. So it is, it is kind of a scratch your head experience being down here now, given California has a similar results, but a population 21% younger than in Florida and they've shut the state and you know unemployment in Florida is like four and a half percent and it's 2x that in California so you know the governor's stomping his chest but it is um it is interesting so I mean California arguably has better weather than Florida <laughs> remember the humidity thing we have here which is supposed to carry the the germs they, they don't have that in California so it, it's kind of kind of an interesting for sure but we're going to come out of this so it's not going to matter it's all going to be retrospective so the whole nation is going to come out of this. I'm so excited. New York City is going to have uh, vaccinations for everyone 16 years and over. I mean, that's basically the whole population. So the future is bright or, or something. <laughs> right. Well, is that where, I guess, when you look out, I guess, has, has your outlook changed as the response to the virus and the vaccine distribution? Has that changed at all in your mind? Well, if you followed anything I, I said, and I happened to say some of this on TV, I thought we'd have a vaccination and, and um, we'd be okay. That was March of last year when I was on TV and, and kind of the lone bull with Mohammed Alarian telling everyone that it was the end of the world and sell everything you had. Um, but I actually what's surprising is the fact, um, like you're in Canada, how poorly the vaccination process has gone and, and much more shocking to me is the European situation right now being so far behind us. And that was not part of my uh, reopening of the world economy process. You know, China's obviously fine. Japan is pretty fine. Korea's fine. The Middle East is fine. Israel's fantastic. Um, but Europe, I did not, and England's now going to be separate from Europe. Continental Europe is more screwed up than England is. So we'll have a extended, it won't open quite as fast as I thought. This summer is going to be a bit of a mystery whether people can actually go on their European vacations, those of us that try to do that or anyone who tries to do that. So I guess um, a little slower in Europe and probably faster than I thought in the U.S. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, it's pretty amazing the pace at which vaccines are being administered today. And, and the nation, I was just looking at a note I got from the CEO of Pebble Beach. I was literally, he just sent it, he goes, they're, they're having, um, things have really taken off. Their March transient bookings were the highest in their history and double the bookings from March two years ago, which was three months prior to the US Open. So, you know, I think I was on TV last week and I said that, you know, the US would open in a frenzy. It's yeah. going to be a frenzy. I mean, it's going to be party land. People are wealthy, you know, unlike the federal government seems to be like way behind the times, but the stock market at all time highs, saving rates like nobody's seen. People paid off their credit card debt. I think it was 80 billion, or maybe it's a trillion. I don't know what the number denominator is, but credit card debt has fallen. I mean, people are in good shape. Housing prices are up. Consumers are ready to spend. Um, and, you know, for the first time in probably, since I left JMB before I started Starwood 40 years, inflation is a real possibility here because there's just yeah. so much money chasing stuff. And um, that's an interesting thing because historically the last 30 years, you know, every inflation assumption you made or 
was wrong. It was always lower than you thought. And uh, you have two forces weighing against each other, the flood of liquidity and all this trillions of dollars looking for yield, pressing yields down, despite the fact that inflation's at two and a half percent or something like that. So you have negative real interest rates, which is hugely <laughs> um, stimulative to the global economy. So, uh, you know, the, the, the issue is uh, you saw this morning and um, the increase in corporate taxes that's going to be pro propel, uh, proposed. Right behind that will be the more controversial individual taxes. And we'll see what the uh, Congress will do by reconciliation versus what they will do and uh, try to do in a bipartisan way. It's interesting that they chose to just attach corporate taxes to the transportation the infrastructure yeah. and, leave, and leave the individual taxes, which will be highly argumentative for later. But I don't, I actually don't know. You could probably tell me, can they do this bill um, in reconciliation, the spending bill? I, I don't know the answer to that. I probably don't, don't know, but um, you know, uh, it's funny. The great builder didn't do an infrastructure bill and the Democrats right. one. So it's like, I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, that's what happened. At least they, right. they're proposing something, whether you like it or not, it's being proposed. And certainly the nation needs a, a serious boost in its infrastructure. And, um, and it's very delayed. And you might as well do it while interest rates are zero or close to it. Um, but it'll be fascinating. I mean, the dysfunctionality of Washington is such a shame. It's such a shame. Right. America has so many issues to face. And, and usually they're not the ones they're arguing about. <laughs> right. How does the uneven response uh, to the virus and the pandemic globally affect your investing decisions, right? So I guess, how are you recalibrating or, or do you just sort of take the view, you know, at some point I'm a long-term investor um, and everyone's gonna get there at some point? Well, I, obviously prop tech and, and developments in, in digital will impact real estate and um, globally at different paces. So I think, you know, our, our generic feelings um, about the asset classes, apartments have had kind of an uh ride, but it, they're winning by the fact by default because there's nowhere else to put the amount of capital people have allocated to real estate. So apartment cap rates have, as I suspected, they might drift down, even though um, NOIs are down and they're down enormously in San Francisco and New York, but they're not down enormously in Dallas, Nashville, Austin, Orlando. Um, as these people go back to work, I mean, I think you'll see some modest, re we're already seeing it, modest reacceleration in, in apartment rents. And I actually think they could go up. I'm a bull in my shop. Most people are not. I am much more bullish than they are on, on the apartment sector. You know, as a calm, calming, it's, you cannot sleep in your computer. It's, it's okay. Um, they'll overbuild. They always overbuild. So you got to pick your markets and, and figure out where to go. Uh, you know, the, the, the industrial market is what it is. It's on fire. There's a, I'm looking at technologies that talk about reordering the, the, the industrial space that would make industrial space 20 times more productive, meaning you need, you need 20 times less space. I mean, if that, if that can happen, uh, hold on to your chair. But right now, you know, industrial is the darling of, of real estate and it trades at uh, absurd cap rates. And even it's being built at single digit, low single digit cap rates. Office is a market where I think you're going to have to be very picky and cherry pick. And, and we are bullish on some markets in Europe and, and, and in Asia, excuse me, and bullish on, on many markets in the U.S., but, but very nervous about New York. And, I, you know, I was at dinner last night with a bunch of people whose names you would know. And, um, you know, we were arguing about New York and how fast does New York recover. And, you know, to the positive, New York is going to get $100 billion from the $1.9 billion stimulus package which is a staggering amount of money because it's a rewarding de Blasio's $9 billion last I checked deficit, city deficit. And it's like, let's all go away and the money will go to the unions and I think uh, enforce, reinforce bad behavior, be behavior that's not conducive for business success. Um, but just as important in New York City is obviously safety, quality of schools, quality of life. And, um, and then the attitude the city has, as San Francisco has, towards capitalism and wealth formation, which I think is long-term negative. And um, you know, I, New York will come back, but people, New York will not turn on a, on a dime. New York has a, you know, the, a, a very significant vacancy factor and a much more significant 
sub um, sublet factor, vacancy sublet space. So I think you're talking almost 20% of the space in New York City for rent against an absorption last year, which is the lowest, I think, in 21 years and akin to what they did in the 07, 08 crisis. So I don't, I don't know. New York has a great institutions. It has kids, it has education, and it has culture when it opens up. But, you know, tax rates that are going up in New York, it's not good for New York. And they're going up. And the question is, how bad? But, there, you, know, you know, I think the pandemic has taught people they could live elsewhere and, and doesn't need to be that struggle. I mean, all my young people want to get back to the city, but the older folks are happy with their suburban lifestyles. <laughs> and uh, so our, our focus as a firm has not been New York and San Francisco. The only thing pulling you into those cities was um, capital, that the foreign capital really likes investing in New York and San Francisco, they're giant markets. But I'd say the entrepreneurial capital was picking the growth cities um, like Nashville, take Nashville, where Alliance Bernstein, Amazon, Soho House, Apple are mo moving and the city's booming. Austin, Texas, which I recently visited in person again, I was like, oh, I, we used to own debt on two of those, the only two, I'd say, AAA class office buildings downtown. <laughs> now there's 40 of them. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and I was like, who's in that building? Facebook, who's in that building? Google, you're like, wow. And and everywhere you look, there's a crane. It used to be just Houston now. I mean, it's it's incredible. So the growth, the momentum of these cities in real estate, I think is real. The issue will be overbuilding and, and the pace of interest rates increasing. And, you know, real estate is always cyclical, inherently cyclical, but but in a world with no yield, we, we still we have a valuable place in, in the investment portfolio. So how much of it is micro focused on a market? I know every deal is unique in that in in every respect and has to stand on its own. But is there sort of like an overarching economic scenario that you're sort of embedding in your projections, whether they be in apartments or office or lodging, just generally from a US perspective, oh. I guess, how optimistic are you uh, in deploying that capital? Um, the big bet has always been interest rates for, um, you know, I think um, rent growth is more important than, than interest rates. If you, if you thought rents were going up 50% a year, you wouldn't care if you're borrowing at two or two and a half or three. Um, but when rent growth is 1% a year, you really do care when you're born at one, two or three. Right. So again, I always tell my guys like, why did rates go up? Do they go up because of economic growth and the kind of economic growth that's good for real estate? Or do they go up for inflation, which may not be good for real estate? Or in the case of the United States, is printing presses that people begin to lose faith. There's just too much paper and not enough demand for the paper. And the Fed's participation in buying that paper is super critical to the keeping rates down right now, because I don't think the U.S. has made a lot of friends around the world in the last four years. So I don't see the Chinese piling in and buying our, our paper. And I think the Japanese are busy buying their own paper. So um, who's going to buy our paper? Um, probably some of the Europeans and the Middle Eastern investors. So there's two things in real estate, right? There's a flow of funds, which sometimes overwhelms fundamentals. And I think capital is flowing to the asset class. Because I think people are looking at the alternative asset classes, obviously the bond market offers very little return. Even high yield is, it's low yielding high yields, right? It doesn't, it's like sub 5%, <laughs> it's sort of a joke. And uh, the covenants, the covenants are the equivalent of me being able to like take down a building that I thought was 50,000 feet and making a million square foot tower on that site. You can do whatever you want in the company, take assets out ahead of it, strip it, assets strip it. I mean, it's barely worth the paper. It's printed on if the company were to get in trouble. So real estate, I think, catches a bid. We're raising our largest fund in history and we've, we've um, our target was eight and a half billion. We'll, we've already exceeded that. We'll keep it open for a few more months. We have a cap. And um, this is the biggest fund we've ever raised. It's probably more diversified by investors than it's ever been. Um, and uh, it's our 12th fund in this series. We've been doing this forever. We invest micro with, with macro themes. And I, I, so one theme is, will the capital keep flowing? And I think the answer is yes, because yeah. we're, 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 we are available to produce yield in a world that's yieldless. And, and of course, you'd like the yield to stay around and go up or instead of going down. 
Um, and if inflation's coming, it's generally good for real estate, existing real estate, if you have fixed rate debt. Um, and I think the odds are higher than lower that inflation will show its face. Um, and then, and then you're picking blocks and cities and, 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 and the quality of the real estate. I, I've grown more and more fixated on the fact that we, you really need to look at the real estate. You know, we, we employ a lot of smart people from a lot of uh, headline business schools. Rarely are our projections accurate. And, um, you know, if you're buying a triple, a triple net lease building to Amazon for 10 years, that's easy to model. But I'm talking about like, how does that building really fit? Like, what does it look like? And how does it look versus its competitors? And where do they put the outlets in the room or the headboard in the, in the you know, I've seen a beautiful buildings built down here. Some of the buildings got in trouble in condos. And you wonder if the architect ever, actually ever went in the building that he designed because the building is beautiful, but the layout of the units makes no sense. There's no room for that on a spreadsheet. You don't see it on a spreadsheet. And I, I, I laugh, but it is actually factually correct that if you grow rev part in a hotel three, four, five percent a year for flat for five years, with 100% certainty, you will be wrong. 100%. It's never been 3% a year for five years in my 31 years of underlying. So do you feel the real estate? Do you really understand the brands? And I think it's so interesting to see with the internet. I was having breakfast with a guy who's created a what will be a $15 billion company in two years on, online. Um, and out of thin air, really. And, and we were talking about how easy it is to create brands online and how the distribution channels, how people will find space and how they will use space and how they will pick a hotel have changed so dramatically in five years. And, you know, people are smart. They, they, they're doing searches. They're finding their own stuff. They're going to find their own space. They'll, it's going to be fascinating to see how this all evolves. So it sounds like a big scatter diagram, but it, it's really not. I mean, I think We've tended to favor low cost states. Um, I think the, the pandemic has accelerated the move to places like Texas and Florida and, and Wyoming and, and either lower tax states or no, uh, Tennessee. Um, and then you have the Carolinas and Georgia. Those are now that's great. But if, it, if they're overbuilding those markets, then it's not that right. exciting. And maybe you can make some money in Minneapolis or Boston or other places, which we've invested in both cities. Um, and we were very constructive on Europe, actually. Uh, you know, I think people will get to work faster. I do believe people will go back to the office. I don't think it'll be pressure on rents for a while, though, in some cities, I, those are the U.S. cities. There are, there's pressure on rents in places like Miami because there's no space and you sort of ask whatever you want. Um, same in Palm Beach. That's, that's an anomaly. There are not many markets like that in the U.S. You still have a situation in some markets in Europe and, um, you know, the TMT companies, the, especially the, the T companies, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Twitters, the Salesforce, I'll take Salesforce out because they've said one thing though, I still believe they'll do the other. Um, these guys are, were the generator, they were the guys using, they were the um, absorption of space in so many cities on the margin. And I, I do think they're gonna go back to doing their old business plan, though they may do it some of it in shared office because you, you saw we we did we did play around with the WeWork uh, SPAC. So um, we do think that business is may may have found its time. So well, you found you were pre-pandemic. You would like the model, right? I mean, yeah. you would like the model and in, in the business. It just has to come I mean, at a valuation why, that makes sense. Tell me why any tenant less than ten thousand square feet would sign a ten-year lease. Like if you were growing, I mean, okay, you're a doctor, you have a medical, yeah, sign your lease, you're gonna have four chairs and you do dentistry for, for 30 years in a small office. But if you're a growing company and you don't know if you're gonna have 10, 50 or 100 employees, there is absolutely no reason to do your own build out and build and sign a long-term commitment to space. When I started Starwood, we borrowed three offices from an ad agency in Chicago <laughs> and I didn't know how big we were. So I was like, I'll take this corner and then I went a little more. And then I came east and, and took some business. We grew out of it, had to sublet it. Um, I, I conceive that this concept of service space as a service makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, if you're Amazon and you're going to Mumbai, is your competitive advantage finding space dealing with local building regulations, doing the logistics of, of furnishing it, that is so not your business. Let someone else do it for you and do it you know, productively and ease in and out as you need. So it makes intuitive sense to me that this is a real opportunity. 
Um, I think the company's in a good place to take advantage of that. And um, I, I just think it makes it makes sense to me that that people should should use the, the shared office space. And I think they have a product that's relevant. You know, I think the other competitors in the field, some of the older ones are more like the Buick and this is more like Tesla. And it's fun. And, and the youth will go back and the youth will be the first to go back because they're immune to COVID. And they want a fun environment. That, that's one of the keys is it's still going to be fun. But I do think the pandemic, you know, will be in the rearview mirror and people will go back to being the social animals they once were. And that's kind of the, the bet there. And, and, and you know, they're, one of the challenges that company, that company has is it's so long, New York and, and London. And, and I'm, I'm not worried about London. I am concerned about New York, how fast people go back to the office. And um, because the city has to open, it has to open sports arenas. He said Broadway in September, the museums are, I guess, are open, but they're, they're, they're limited. Um, restaurants, some of them are gone for a long time. It's, um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm not, I'm not worried. I'm much more worried about the, the national situation and, and um, okay. tax rates and, and what that does to the, if, if the equity markets took a bloodbath and, and they certainly set themselves up to take a serious correction, that won't be good for capital and it won't be good for real estate either. So, right. so let's go back to the, the office discussion and maybe New York specifically. I guess in the environment where serviced office, let's say, works really well because people want to go back, congregate, get out of their homes. Why won't all the corporates and all their employees want to get back to their own offices with their fellow colleagues on a more regular basis? Like if you have one, why don't you have the other? No, I agree. I mean, but I do think the companies will bring their people back. You know, we opened our offices in New York as soon as we were allowed to by the mayor and everyone showed up. Um, nobody, the, the young associates and analysts didn't want to stay in their apartments. They wanted to come to the city. Now, if we hadn't opened them, I'm sure they would have gone home to mom and dad and wherever they were from and they would have stayed there and worked from there. But given the choice, I think they, they, they were happy to come back. I, I do think people want to, I think the office is more than work. It's like social and it's random interactions with people and it's so much better to meet face to face if you can, and it's infinitely better. And the Zooms is just tiring, you know? So, and it's not that productive. I want a one minute call with my partner. I mean, we're here in Miami, we're all in the office. You know, I walk down the hall, say, hi, what, what about this? Walk back to my office. I'm gonna schedule a Zoom call for it. And, I, and it's just, um, maybe I'm old school, but I, I, and I, I think there are industries, the tech industry in particular, it's one of the reasons San Francisco will have a CBD San Francisco will have a tougher time, maybe even than New York. Um, and New York's issue is again, quality of life and safety, the commute in and out of that town. Will people from New Jersey want to, if they can stay home on Friday and not have to deal with rush hour traffic over the, the two bridges or the two tunnels, they're going to stay home. And, and if the companies let them do that, so you'll have an abbreviated work week in New York. And, but I do think come um, September, 80, 80%, 85% of people will be back in the office. So, you know, now again, that doesn't address the vacancy rates in New York, which are right. material. So, you know, is there, and so the one thing, again, when you talk about rents, forget about rents, forget about interest rates, let's talk about expenses. Like, you know, municipalities are leaning heavily on their real estate tax, you know, of commercial buildings to balance budgets and they, they think they're taxing no one. So, you know, expenses have been the part that's probably surprised Starwood the most is, is fortunately rents went up to offset that, but commercial buildings in the, and especially in the blue states where they have terribly imbalanced budgets, right. um, you know, whether Chicago, New York, San Francisco, to some extent LA, um, you know, it's really tough. Tennessee raised taxes 35% on commercial buildings in a one-time bill to pay for the impact of the pandemic. And by the way, the buildings didn't vote. <laughs> right. nobody, called, nobody called and said, "Is this okay?" Yeah. Um, so look, I think I think you got to be a, you got to be swift. You got to pick your themes. You got to pick your spots. And then for us, we have to go and scale. And and I think one of the interesting things is the 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 nature of the market today, which we really haven't talked about. But you know, there hasn't been a lot of distress. Um, right. There's a few guys in New York upside down, and there will be a few more. But because rates are so low and the banks have no desire whatsoever to foreclose and take a property back and then have to fund it 
you know, its losses. Um, you know, they've been, um, we used to call it pretend and extend, but I'll just say we, 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 um, we, we, we adjusted the, you know, and made the forbear, we forbeared as an right. industry. And, and so now I think as the world comes back, it's going to be, you're going to see more distress. You're going to see more sales and, um, there'll be more to do. It reminds me exactly of 2007, 2008, the world was actually on its behind and the banks were loads of the gills with bad loans. They didn't sell anything because they couldn't take the capital hit. And then as they were able to replenish their balance sheets, given the, the net interest margin because rates, they were able to lend at three and borrow at zero. Eventually they recapitalized and then they got their capital ratios back. They started to liquidate their books and redeploy the capital. So you're gonna see the exact same thing. The banks never got bad balance sheets in this, but, but they didn't want to take the assets back, but the, the government just basically tightened by, you know, as you know what they did last week. And with the treasury accounting, so um, I think you'll see a lot of assets moved in the next two years, which is akin to 2010 versus and nine versus two thousand and then 2010 when they, when the yeah. market sort of took velocity. And I think also there's been a price discovery, right? Everyone, the people in the market last year were trying to buy stuff, you know, at rock bottom prices, and the sellers, if they could hold on, didn't want to sell. So transaction right. volumes were down. And our big efforts, actually, as you know, we have four, well, three announced, but a forthcoming tender offers for public companies. Um, and we found better discounts in the public markets to what we think are, are good values than in the than in the private markets. So we have an offer in the in Germany, the UK, um, US, all different industries, by the way, and then um, one coming in Asia soon. A, a take private attempt. <laughs> we'll see right. if we're <laughs> right. So, well, um, I mean, there is a significant amount of money uh, out there. I remember thinking about the GFC. You know, I remember it was like 2010. We said distressed sellers become distressed buyers. It was a pretty short period of time, and almost shorter now in terms of the rebound and the amount of money. You talked about it earlier. How much money is sloshing around the system? And you didn't even mention all the SPAC money that's been raised that, you know, is, is just an adjunct to everything that's already been out there in terms of just that rearranging well, of where the capital sits. You know, I, when I started out, I used to say my favorite market was the equity market. And it was just because it was liquid, you can get in and out of it. And, um, and real estate was, was tougher. It was less, less liquid. Um, and then I kind of liked real estate more recently over the equity market because I find the equity markets are have less <laughs> have lost all rationality. And 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 I, I kind of feel for my hedge fund friends that start out in the value investing and these short things that didn't make any sense. And it's impossible. It's really just a, a giant casino now. It, it has really nothing to do with fundamentals. And the people I've been doing this for so long, people tell me the company's only 12 times revenues and their peers are 20 times revenues. We used to talk about 12 times cash flow, right. <laughs> 20 <laughs> times cash flow. And, yeah. and you know, the, 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 the great Houdini thing, the, 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 the big joke is that these companies can grow revenues at huge paces when they're losing money. And if they have to actually turn the profit and they can't keep doing this forever and can't deficit spend because the capital dries up, they either go bankrupt or they shrink. And the end game here, whenever it happens, is going to be unbelievably ugly. And, and people, you know, the market never does this. It never allows you for long periods of time to make money out of air. And it always corrects. And when it will correct, I don't know. Um, there'll probably be some macro thing that happens, a tax change or the Fed changing their policy and, and, and becoming restrictive or less accommodative. But something's going to pop the bubble. And I, I, I remember most people aren't old enough, um, especially your students, the O one O you know dot com bubble, when when um, I, I was running Starwood Hotels at the time, we made a billion six, and I think my market cap was like eight billion, and I was sitting next to a woman who ran a telecommunications company that had four million in revenue and was worth ten billion dollars right. at market cap, and I said you need to buy us at lunch, and she yeah. laughed and said I'm serious, you need to buy us, <laughs> like I'll sell you the company, but at least when the world ends, you'll have something. And P.S. Two years later, she didn't exist anymore. The company was gone, and yeah. you will see that over and over. I have three SPACs I've done, and and um, 
I see all these companies and I'm like, what's your path to profitability? And many of these companies, they have their gross margin negative before they even get to overhead. They're not making right. money. And there is no path to profitability that I have to raise prices at the, at the pay at, and your sales will go down. It's not like hard to figure this out. So if you lose money with every, every product you sell, you know, you're going to be big, but you're going to, at some point you have, to, that's not going to work for you. And, you know, these companies, uh, wow. And, and retail's participation in the market, lowest short interest in history. I'm terrified of shorting anything because I'm going to get game stopped. And right. it's it really, you know, I, I, I just marvel at companies that I know are broken, like 1% gross margin companies going to get $20 billion market caps. I mean, they're, they're going to zero. It's just when, and I, I, I can't tell you when, but I know they'll go down and I'm just too scared to short everything. <laughs> right. How do you feel uh, about lodging uh, coming out of this? You talked, you were on CNBC, I don't know if it was earlier this week or last week, talking about this travel frenzy. <coughs> How are you going to know if it's a mirage versus something that's sustainable in terms of demand? And then I want to get into a little bit about sort of group. Yeah, I mean, my, my macro would be we're going to have a great summer and a good fall, and then the economy is going to slow. Um, and I think you know, be very hard. Um, there'll be easy comparisons for a while and then, and then it'll get trickier and the Democrats will raise taxes enough to probably put a crimp in the, in the equity markets. Um, but free money is free money. And there's a lot of it. And, and the U S government is not alone. The governments of the whole planet earth. I think they're over six, last I saw 640 stimulus measures worldwide. So the game that we're playing, everyone's playing yeah. and, and, you know, somebody, I was talking to somebody in crypto the other day who's made a fortune in crypto. And I said to her, you know, sell a quarter of your crypto holdings because she's 100% crypto and, and buy the Norwegian Kronar, a country with no net debt, you know, <laughs> and just right. put it away because, you know, printing presses of the world unite. I mean, if this ends, it'll be as obvious as the housing crisis, right? You just can't do this. You can't keep printing money as, and, and, and calling it that has value. So, and the U.S. has been reliant, you know, obviously the biggest challenge would be if the U.S. lost its reserve currency status. And the Chinese obviously like nothing better than for us to lose our reserve currency status. That would be the end of the ball game. And, you know, interest rates would skyrocket. We'd have to talk about balanced budgets. We'd have to change everything. And the Chinese economy is positioned for far faster growth than ours. And their, their reach around the world has been incredible and and you know they're running that country like a company with a with a ceo who's really good and and he's investing in infrastructure and, and all over the world and and building his he 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 bought his natural resource base i mean they are they are that's a that's a, and our relationship with them could probably get more could get more competitive and more tempestuous you know it, with this administration than even the last one um and I, 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 we could have shared global growth, but I don't know if that's the um, the politically uh, the, the political path we're on. So, you know, it doesn't look like we're talking about what we can do to help each other. It looks like we're, you know, they're look they're gonna they could go after Taiwan, and um, that would be interesting. <laughs> so, you know, and I think uh, I don't know. I mean, like. I don't know. It's, it's but when you look for what could cause this market to go, it's probably going to be something like that. You know, something that we're not thinking about that that enters our and causes us to say, "I'll, I'll just sell now. I'll come back in later." And 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 when enough people do that, I mean, money's been made too easily in so many businesses. And as I told my children, they they don't coat it a different color. It's all a green. <laughs> Whether you made it by years and years of hard toil, or you had a startup and it did two million in revenue, and somebody just gave you a hundred million at three billion pre, <laughs> yeah. which you see. Yeah. I learned about a company literally this morning that I put a little bit of money into, and in one year it went from a twenty million post to a billion. Uh, I think it raised a hundred million at a billion pre. I'm like. I mean, really? <laughs> okay. And, and you feel like you got a markup, but you really didn't get a markup. You got an air. This is an air thing. And it's like, it, right. it's air. There's nothing. I mean, obviously it's a good company, but is it worth a billion dollars? I mean, if you took the, the world we grew up in, in real estate and said, when will that company make a hundred million? So it's worth 10 times a billion dollars. When will Tesla make $53 billion? 
that's 10 times their $530 billion market cap. I might be off on that. I haven't looked in the last week. Um, how about never? It will never make $53 billion, ever. It will never happen. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. The market doesn't care. And, and Tesla's the most owned stock in the stock market. And Apple, which somebody compared the two the other day on TV, and I almost fell out of my chair. I mean, Apple has is like, I don't know, 12, 13 times EBITDA. Tesla's right. like 600 times EBITDA. I mean, the cult of personality, it's a great company. I own three Teslas. It's still not worth half a trillion dollars. So um, it was worth a lot more earlier in the year. So that is why I do real estate still, because at least right. I, I, I compound returns at reasonable, attractive rates in a world with no yield over long periods of time. And, and you get rich slow, but hopefully you'll stay rich. <laughs> I hope. <Right. laughs> hope our clients about, do well. Would you go into big group? big box hotels at this point? Can you find those opportunities? Do you think that business comes back to the extent of the number of people that can attend conferences and, and do all the sorts of things that we want to be doing? Um, it's not our, our target. Um, you saw we made an investment in, or made an offer to take extended stay hotels private. Um, those are domestic transient boxes with some corporate accounts, but um, no, I, I don't, um, I don't know how these big boxes are going to fill the city, the weeks, the weekdays for a while. And, uh, you know, if they do like the Marriott Marquis in New York city, it's going to have to discount the heck out of its room rates and, and cities will be waterfalls because the only reason I'd stay in the Marriott Marquis is if it was $39 all you could sleep because I'd rather stay somewhere else. Right. But I go there for the price probably, um, I think you won't see foreign travel. This is why New York is going to be delayed. You know, you're not going to see foreign travel come back till probably the end of 23. So from an investing standpoint, unfortunately, time value of money is super important. And when would I buy that? You know, maybe I'd buy it closer to international travel coming back. New York City relies heavily on foreign tourism. And, and there aren't any foreign tourists. <laughs> so that's a tricky town right now. Um, but there are other markets which don't have that and, and don't have the, you know, that don't have that, that reliance and, and, and they'll, they'll be okay. Transient business. Yeah. You know, I just, our, our hotel, the one hotel in South beach that I built a few years ago with Richard LaFrac, you know, we, we are having a record year this year record. The first three months will be the highest cash flow and revenue in history, even including 2019, which included the Super Bowl. So, wow. I mean, it's $1,600 a night and 97% occupancy. I, like, you know, I've been doing hotels a long time. I've never seen anything like that. And that, you know, domestic, it's domestic travel. They can get to Florida. The flights are cheap. The rooms are good sized. And it's a fun hotel. So, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, but those transient and resorts are going to have a great time. And I mean, you, you, I actually was kidding someone this morning as I haven't booked my my, I haven't thought about the summer, but you better book your travel right now because <laughs> you ain't getting in if it's domestic. So and I'm not sure people will go, but they'll book and then they'll cancel. <laughs> so it's going to be a it's going to be a party this summer in the U.S. I, again, back to your question, I don't I don't think big groups return in force till you know mid mid twenty second quarter twenty three domestically. Um, you're seeing weddings get rescheduled and stuff like that, but that's not the big corporate outing. That isn't what fills the Marriott Marquis or the Sheridan in San Francisco or the, you know, the Marriott's in downtown anywhere. And, um, and I just don't see people, companies making their, forcing the people to travel to a, to an outing. Vegas has been a really interesting question, right? And, and the stocks, by the way, the travel stocks among all the stocks in the world are probably way ahead of themselves in my opinion. Yeah. You know, the travel stocks, Unlike, I think, apartment REITs look cheap, office REITs look cheap, retail, some of it looks cheap. Um, I think the, uh, the hotel stocks are, are, are significantly ahead of the sustainable returns. I mean, Marriott had an all-time high the other day, and, and that just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So I'm not picking on Marriott, but um, all the hotel stocks hit all-time highs, you know, Hilton, Marriott, Intercon. And You're talking about a party in the party in the USA, which I think yeah, is that's a Miley that's Cyrus a party. song. But the that's party a ends. <laughs> they go back to regular life and regular spending, and people back at work, and they have to do stuff, and you know they have to. And and, and there's only it's funny. I, I did a speech at Brown, my alma mater, and I put up a chart of the you know the one thing you know is there's only 24 hours in a day, 
right? So if you're not if you're not on your game at home and you're not doing your Zoom and you've you've ordered everything you possibly need for at Amazon for your house and you fixed up your work from home space, something's gonna you got something else you gotta do something else. <laughs> so, right. Um, I, I I don't think. You can you know what's going to happen. Zoom use will drop. It will still be used. It's efficient, um, and and we'll use it all the time now. For like when we're talking to our London offices or our Tokyo office, we'll do them. We do that every morning on Monday. I I assume we'll do that forever now instead of just you know we'll just have a Zoom call. But uh, a lot of conferences will take place in person. I think yeah. people like the reason I go to real estate conferences is my chance to randomly meet somebody. You know, yep. and randomly, you know, it's like, oh, that's what you do. Oh, let's go get together. And 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 that's that's what I like about real estate. I mean, I like I like the fact that it's physical and you meet people, it's a people business and it's design and it's fun and interesting. And you know, I don't I don't I'm not for me, that's not what I why you know, I do real estate for that, you know. In fact, otherwise I'd be a trader, which I once once was. So I totally agree with you. I think once and I think we're getting there. We're in this spot right now where you can sort of see it and it's already happening. People want to congregate with each other. There are so much benefits to being in person, whether you're working with someone or whether you're traveling to a market. So if I came down and we did a sitting in Florida, I'd make it productive. I wouldn't be just going down to see you. I'd be able to say, you know, I'll go tour some malls. I'll go tour some <laughs> uh, Now you're upset. <laughs> you would be the centerpiece of my day. I feel better. <laughs> You'd be the entree. No, no, no. Get an it's, it's, um, you know, it's funny because like you could meet people on on um, Bumble or Tinder or whatever your social app match or or whatever those things are, the league. Or you could go to a Clubhouse. bar. People There's still go to a bar. bar. <laughs> people still do that. It's not efficient, you know, but it's fun and random. And you, you know, and you go with your buddies. And you, I can't see buddies going online to date people in groups online. <laughs> So I, I don't, it's so overblown. I mean, everybody thinks it's all one, all the other, it's somewhere in the middle, but Zoom is going to attract travel. I think, you know, one of the things that we think about is what's the long-term impact of the pandemic on business travel. And so if business travel was going like this, I have to do this right in your screen, Right, it's going to grow, but it's going to grow less, right? Because yep. you've lost 10% at a minimum. And you can argue as much as 20% of the business travel or more is gone. So it'll take a while before it's gone. It's, you know, it's, it is a pain in the neck to get on a plane and go wherever you want to go. On the other hand, a lot of people want to get on a plane and go. They want to, I'm like that. I'm one of these people that I, I almost need to travel. Like I need to change my, my, my scenery. I need to do it. It's like, it's my DNA. So last summer in the middle of pandemic, I went, I found a way to get to Europe and I went. So, you know, I like, I just went to Cal to Aspen and I, I just had to go. <laughs> I just didn't want to stay where I am, even though it's lovely. So I'm kind of one of these people that needs to do that. But if you can afford to do it, whether it's in an RV or going to the national parks, or I think that's America. So I'm not worried about that. And, and, you know, I think we're going to, I think we're going to travel. Right. Um, you mentioned uh, the SPACs and uh, crypto uh, is are you going to get into NFTs and figure no. out a way to uh, to brand something of yours uh, and sell well, no, it? No, I hadn't really thought about. It. Nobody asked me to brand anything of mine, but um, I, I, do I, I do I, own I, I do own Bitcoin. I, I did buy Bitcoin right after PayPal. Um, you announced they were putting it on their platform, and again, I you know somebody said, and I agree, one one two three percent of your net worth in, in something that should. It won't, it will, it's as speculative as, as the equity markets today, but longer term, it's a finite amount of, thi of, of a thing that's available to the whole world, not just Americans, but if you live in Argentina or you live in Par uh, Paraguay <laughs> or, or um, you know, Botswana and you wanna store, you want, you're worried about your currency, your government, whatever, there's one global coin you can buy, which frankly is a useless coin. It's not, it's not like Ethereum or some of the other uh, coins. It has no utility, but it is it has first mover advantage. And you know, I I I wouldn't put my net worth in it, but but putting a, a, a as a hedge against paper fiat currencies, I get that, even though it's gonna be wildly volatile. So I've done fine in my 
my position. Um, and I think, you know, everybody should have a piece of this because the government, you know, the, the problem we have is the Republicans taught the Democrats that spending was not an issue. I mean, Donald Trump's miracle was, was led by a trillion dollar deficit with the lowest unemployment rate we've ever seen. And they talk about his economy. Well, I can do really well if I don't ever, I could buy everything in the store if I never had to pay for it. And that's what the Trump economy was. And now the Democrats have said, look, you just did that. And, and by the way, interest rates fell. While Trump was spending money, interest rates fell. And they're like, how's that supposed to happen? So the Democrats said, I can, I can do, spend whatever I want because interest rates will never go up. Wrong conclusion, but it's the Republicans' fault to some extent because they taught them that, I mean, they can't, now they're fiscally disciplined. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> now? So uh, there was a lot of stuff to do. Sadly, most of this money, the $1.9 trillion was completely irresponsible. The entire unemployment of the United States is in the leisure and travel sector. There's only two industries with double digit unemployment, travel, leisure, restaurants, entertainment, right. and mining, mostly coal, I guess, and, and, right. and the, the complex. And so all those people, I just saw the jobs numbers this morning, I think it was 169,000 jobs created in leisure and hospitality. Well, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Our occupancies are going up, right? And we're going to yeah. hire everyone we can if you haven't given them too much unemployment benefits. And then they'll come back. And I just was at a hotel here and I saw the GM of the, and I said, oh, it's nice to see you because I was just hired back. I'm like, oh, that's how it works. And they right. did not need a 1.9 trillion. I, I, the number I saw, I, you probably saw, is fourteen thousand dollars for every American, of which they gave you back fourteen hundred dollars. Those making less than seventy five hundred dollars, seventy five thousand yeah. dollars. So twelve and a half thousand dollars per person went somewhere else. It didn't go to the to the um, the fourteen hundred dollar check. Uh, they just covered. They threw the kitchen sink in there, and you know, giving New York City a hundred billion dollars. Honestly, I don't think De Blasio ran a good city. And I don't think he ran a city for, poised for success. And it's interesting, you asked me about markets. We would rather invest in Berlin and London and Paris before we invest in New York because hmm. they're not talking about taxing everyone out of the city and, and making life for the corporations a mess. And, and frankly, that's, you know, that's our capital and our investors' capital can go anywhere. And it, it's my mayor here in Miami is out putting up billboards in California <laughs> saying, <laughs> come see us, we're open for business. Yeah. And the Founders Fund just took 30,000 feet in Wynwood in the design district equivalent here. I mean, it's not that hard, right? If you kick people in the face long enough, they're gonna do something else. <laughs> so, right. you know, and I, I haven't yet been able to chain people to their buildings or their homes or their desks, but maybe that somebody will come up, that'll be a political platform coming up. I mean, the US has to fix education and everything else will follow from that and everything else is right. noise. Um, Barry, I wanna leave you with, um, just from a leadership perspective, you know, Starwood has, I think it's like 4,000 employees uh, worldwide. Every leader has had to make changes to their leadership style and approach as the pandemic hit. What change did you make that you think is gonna stick post pandemic? Huh. Um. Now, I guess your move down to Florida was from Greenwich, was that a that pre or 20, post pandemic? 2016, really. Um, you're on TV, whoever that is. <laughs> um, hi, Sonny. Uh, I, I guess, you know, I think crises or, or, or bad situations or leaders are supposed to absorb uncertainty. I, I think it's probably one of the highest, um, most important quality of a leader is not to create more uncertainty, but to absorb uncertainty and to make your people feel loved and stable and you know we we created a we raised uh i think i'm over a million dollars for our employees of our hotel company and i, I think i put in either a million maybe it's a million and a half and i put in a million dollars just to help them through the crisis so i think that goes a long way to creating a culture of caring and compassion and the kind of culture you know i want to work in um so you know we passed the hat among the executive among the whole firm and said do you want to help out these these people who we had to let go um i think uh I think I think crises are a terrible thing to waste. So I think we 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 kind of uh, tightened up some things. Um, and I, I also think it gave me the opportunity to 
to talk even more aggressively about prop tech and new ways that we should be thinking about doing things, or at least making sure we don't get left behind as, as other companies adopt technology, which might let them either price their room better or run their apartment more efficiently or lower their, you know, their, their, their title costs. Um, the industry is still very old fashioned. And, and um, you know, I think, I think also, but I, I, I don't, I didn't change a lot. I, I think, I think um, I've, I've learned, I've learned to tolerate work from home. It's not my style. <laughs> not mine either. I'm, He's not, a major... I'm not a fan. <laughs> so I want people, I feel better seeing my team and I want them to be jazzed up about every day. And I want to see them, you know, so I think from that extent, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a great work from home CEO. <laughs> Right. It's hard. Even though I'm it's actually doing hard. this from my house today, but that's because I have a cold and I'm not going to get anyone sick. So it's productive. We can be productive and complete yeah. tasks, but yeah. you don't advance the same way. You don't get the same sort of feeling and motivation of a win or a difficult situation. It, it's just being well, it's together. Like David Radcliffe from Google, who runs real estate for Google, said that our productivity was holding up, was beginning to slip, but he said we lost our creativity. Which interesting, yeah. you don't think of that as being something that comes from two random guys chatting a, by, a, by a water cooler. You know, yeah. and then I actually, you know, today this morning, this guy, was, I was talking to this guy and he gave me a really good idea for something. And I'm like, it was random, but I met him and we went off right. topic. It wasn't the topic of our, our meeting. And I'm like, you know, I guess it could happen with you, but in this call, but. Um, well, we, anyway. we're, we're going to NFT your heavenly bed patent. That's going to be. I don't uh, have the branding rights anymore. <laughs> oh <laughs> no! <thing. laughs> we'll, we'll, go we'll, have think, we'll have to go figure out something else that we can NFT of Barry Sternlitz world. So, <laughs> yeah. um, great. Well, I really appreciate uh, you doing this. It's great seeing you. Can't wait Pleasure. to see you in person again. And uh, thanks, speak Michael. to you soon. Good luck, okay. everyone. Stay safe and healthy, okay. and have a great summer.